It's another week and another dialogue options. And as promised last week, I am not wearing green because Mark Barlet is back, founder and executive director of Able Gamers. Mark, thanks for joining us. Hi. Okay, now I've been chewing on something since last week. Okay. This idea that people think that making games more accessible makes games easier. I have okay. not been able to get that through my head. So I wonder if we could start there. What is the argument and what is the reality? What actually is accessibility in gaming? So uh, the argument that we've heard is that there's this, there's this thought that to, in order to make games accessible for people with disabilities, you have to make them easier. Mm -hmm. And that's not really the case. Um, but when you kind of just, like, if you're like a hardcore gamer and you just like kind of think like, you don't put a lot of thought into it and you just look the first thing that comes to mind, you know, you kind of go to some pretty extremes when we even talk about disabilities. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have, we don't, you know, we don't even really define what a disability is. Both you and I are wearing glasses. Yeah. Is that, is, I mean, that's, we both have assistive devices attached to our faces right now. Exactly. And um, so I think people like kind of panic and they think, well, oh, that means you're going to make all the, the quick time events. And, you know, I'm an expert, you know, you know, I'm a super sharp shooter and, you know, whatever the, you know, the game is. And if mm -hmm. you make it easier, then it won't be as fun for me. Well, wouldn't that mean that accessibility challenges would be solved with easy mode? Well, and that's what we try to, that's exactly what we try to explain to people that, you know, we don't have to change the vision of the game. We just have to add features to it. And if right. you choose not to use that feature, hey, that's cool. Right. But like why, you know, I don't think, I think a lot of people think it's an and or an or, and it's an and. It's an and. Yeah. yeah. It, you know, yeah. It, it's either easy or hard. No, it can be easy and hard. Yeah, I guess I have trouble getting my head around this because I come from I come from television, and there we have both closed captioning That'll and never described take video. Off, by the way. TV now. Yeah. Well, it was funny. I worked in TV when they were saying TV was dying, and I worked in radio when radio was dying, and I transitioned to um, gaming just for people to say it. Oh, so it's going to be dying next, <laughs> it was right? Dying. But everything's still around. It's funny that. But I mean, in television, we had described video, we have uh, closed captioning, and these are all things that we just, okay, every so often, sometime a, a new technology comes along that allows more people to consume our products. That is good. We want that. Um, with YouTube, it, it was actually a unique challenge for me. I, I started doing YouTube, believe it or not, because I got people saying that they were blind, but they wanted to consume my written content. And so I just started reading my articles and putting them on YouTube. And, and that's sort of how it started. And it, it went from there. And um, so uh, this is odd to me. And, you know, you brought up that question of what is accessibility? And that prompted another question for me is, is accessibility just about how you interface with the game? Or is there a, is there a, a component that is the depiction of people with disabilities within the game as well? Um, so it's, it's interesting. We've, we've had discussions around so one of the one of the organizations that really inspired able gamers when when we were really young was um, an organization called Big Blacks in Gaming, mm -hmm. and what that was really what that organization was trying to do was really twofold. It was trying to you know make sure that we were including African Americans in the development world, but also really trying to change how people of color were were depicted in games, mm -hmm. and. The reality is we have not really gotten to a point within our own movement where we can even have that secondary discussion. Really? We're still trying to figure – I mean, like, the amount of developers that I know who are profoundly disabled, mm -hmm. I can probably count on my hands. So I think that we're still – you know, there's there is this 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 fact, which is if you if you build things and you do things with a diverse population, then a lot of the diversity challenges that are needed kind of get built in automatically. You know, um, so when you look at women in STEM, you know, you do, you you know, the more women that are that are participating in the sciences, you know, that's going to dispel a lot of stereotypes that you hear a lot of people arguing now. So I actually think that 
we are really concerned with how people with disabilities are depicted in gaming, mm -hmm. but th I'm, I, I'm still trying to get the first part done, right. which is how to get people with disabilities consuming. Like, if I can't get people with disabilities playing the game, who cares how they're depicted in the game? That's true. I mean, you know, the argument that I get all the time with, with and I completely agree with you about women in STEM, women in gaming, I kind of feel like I'm a, a test project for that. Um, but I get, well, if the games don't appeal to women, then their women aren't going to play games. And, you know, I'm like, I think that's a terrible, but, 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 okay. So show me what women want. Give me like three things that all women want. Now, like, is, is this a point of commonality that people think there's more sameness between people with disabilities than there actually I, I, is? No, I actually think there's more, I think people think there's sameness among any way you slice our demographic. Right. I think there are pe people think there's sameness among people with disabilities. Uh -huh. There's sameness among Hispanic populations. There's sameness among women. Right. There's sameness among gays. I don't, I mean, that's, that's, none of that is real, but I think we all think that. Yeah. 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 So well, I don't I, think, I don't think in this case, I don't think people with disabilities are special in, in that thought process. I think that's what everyone kind of thinks. Okay. You, you said sort of a buzzword there, the idea of special, the whole special treatment argument. Whenever you get into an inclusivity argument, you get that, well, why should someone get special treatment? And it's, th this is, this is a mindset. It is the difference between equal access, meaning different things for different people and people thinking different equals special. So I wonder if you could sort of shed some light on this challenge here of messaging. Um, you know, I'm really not sure how to wrap ha wrap my head around that. Right. You know, um, you know, besides being a disability advocate, you know, I am part of the LGBT community. And, you know, here in the United States, uh, gay marriage was something that the Supreme Court, like, literally just mm -hmm. this past summer opened up. And I've heard a lot of people say, oh, well, that's special rights, that's special rights. And it's and it's not. It's not yeah. special rights at all. It's just like the same rights that everyone else has. We've, sl you know, maybe we've sliced the bread long ways instead of this way. It's still bread and we still all are hungry. Yeah. So um, I don't think, I don't think it's special. I think what it is, is just, it's just access. And I think we as a people owe our fellow gamers access to the medium that we love. And, you know, why would you want to deny someone, like if you enjoy a video game and something that you do, why would you want to deny that same joy from someone else? Um, yeah. That's not special. I mean, and everyone approaches things differently. I mean, we're all different. I mean, everything about us is different from each other. That's what mm -hmm. makes humanity pretty, pretty interesting and sometimes, you know, pretty uh you know pretty like crazy but yeah. we're all we all need something like we all have likes right. and we all have dislikes we all need something that you know we don't all we all want something that might be different than what other people want yeah i mean that's why they put options in games at all that's why your tv has options that's why the seat in your car has six things that can be adjusted right because we're all different we all want something different now, let me run something by you based on that, because, I mean, difficulty modes are obviously something that developers put in to appeal to more people. But something like changing the size of a game font, which the, the number one thing on, on my Party Chatter series that people responded to was the size of the fonts in gaming. The minute we went to high def, nobody can read those little yeah. tiny words anymore. And it's a, obviously it's an identifiable problem for people with vision impairments. But the number of you know sighted people who are like, I can't read these things either was profound. So why do we see difficulty settings as kind of, well, the, and these other accessibility toggles as something like, oh, well, you know, that costs money. So I think it's, I think it's because people who build video games are artists. Okay. And they want people to love their art. Okay. I mean, think about when you, I mean, if anyone's actually ever looked at the credits for their favorite video game. There are writers and graphic artists and sound. I mean, there's, you've worked in TV. I mean, there's like literally whole productions. So if you're an artist, let's just say you were a television show mm -hmm. or a movie. So mm -hmm. you, you know, you, someone buys the movie, someone pays the, 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 
the 20 bucks, I don't know how much it is in Canada to see a movie, but, you know, Friday night is pretty expensive here. And then, like, seven minutes in the movie, someone taps you on the shoulder and tells you you have to leave. Right. Here, though, as the actor, if I think I did a really good job as an actor, wouldn't I want everyone to see how good I acted? That's my craft. That's what I do. See, that was our philosophy when we did television, which is why I'm... I'm... But I think that's why... I think gamer... The reason why we have difficulty settings is because uh-huh. ultimately, at the end of the day, the artists that create that game want you to consume their art. Right. And if and if, if in doing that means they have to... Because I'm terrible at first-person shooters. Okay. If you put a really good story in a first-person shooter, but you make it hard, I will never consume your story. Right. Why would you want that? You a lot work of people, really hard at it. A lot of people just burn through for the story, whereas I'm the other way. The story can be incredible, but if the game is too easy, I get bored. It doesn't hold me. I, I feel like the same way I do sorting receipts. So, I mean, gaming is... But I played is, Fallout. I played Fallout. And I would seek things out because I loved the story. I loved right. the world. Yeah. And I put it on easy mode um, because I frankly wasn't there to get a, like to kill, kill, kill high score. That wasn't my intent. My intent was to consume this rich world that a lot of people worked really hard to give me. Right. But that, I mean, that is the soul of interactive entertainment, giving the player their experience, not the, the exper- experience, you know, you, you, you change the paradigm there. So why the mental disconnect when it comes to this somewhat arbitrary line we, um, we set? And it is really arbitrary when you look at it between, you know, normal people and people with disabilities. I don't I don't think I fully understand what you're asking me. Like why why is it all of a sudden this idea that this is too much work or this is somewhere we can't go or when when there is this market and it's mm-hmm. fairly large. I'm not sure what the um what 20% the of the population is disabled. Okay, so, so 20%. That is huge when any game is a piece of a pie that's a piece of a pie that's a piece of a pie. I mean, it's a slice of a slice of a slice, yep. right? Why would it not, why is it not seen as just good business to increase your potential sales pool by 20% doing simple things like, you know, for instance, putting patterns on your puzzles instead of just colors for the color. Right. Blend? So I think, I think if we were having this conversation five years ago, I'd have a completely different answer for you na- than okay. I do now. So I think a lot of the, I think a lot of games are doing much better in what I would call basic accessibility. Okay. And I think that's through the work of able gamers and and us, you know, really kind of going out there and advocating as a market and as a people and saying. So I think the awareness of the feature sets that are needed to support people with disabilities is much more common than it was even five years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, so I would say for the most part, I mean, I, I'll give you an explanation of why I think, I mean, I'll give you an example of why I think we've made such a positive impact. One of the differentiators that PlayStation did to try to differentiate itself from the Xbox is they actually put accessibility features in at the core level of the game. They put them in so that if a game did not allow button remapping, don't worry. You can actually do it at the firmware level. Oh yeah, that, now. that's in like yeah, the system then, tab. Yeah. Yeah, and so and then, very soon after that, um, Xbox came along and did did a very very similar thing. Interesting. So I think, you know, I would have never if you would have told me mm-hmm. three years ago that I would be able to tell you that a major accessibility feature such as button remapping was going to be standard features in both the major consoles, I would have told you that you're dreaming. That's interesting. Now, but what, there it is. What is it about button remapping from you know, a disability advocacy standpoint that is an accessibility feature? Well, I mean, like, if you look at the standard controller, and what's really funny is I have something cool to show you. So um, I did an event. So if look, it's a squishy Xbox controller. It's a Whoa. stress ball. Yeah, it's a stress ball. So it's That's a stress X. Yeah. So, uh, but if you look at this, I'm actually not. Look, I have all these fingers that are not doing anything. Yes. I mean, this is a really inefficient. If you think about it, for people with t- this is a terrible yeah. set because you're literally only using like these. Oh, my video froze up. 
There you're only go. using like these fingers. Yeah. Maybe only these. Yep. But for some people, these trigger buttons. I'm one of them. You, you're might, holding my Waterloo, the Xbox it might as controller. Well, the, trigger, the trigger button might as well be on a wall behind you. That's how inaccessible it is. Well, I just if I have to press down on that Xbox trigger enough, it causes pain right down my arm. Yep. Yeah. So, so, but what if I've got nothing going on on that Y button? Why can't I move that trigger button to that Y button? Right. What does it hurt you? Does it change your gameplay at all? Well, no. Right. So no, that's, it's the same as inverting the axis on a on a flight mechanic. Right. So yeah. that's. I mean, the, the 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 whole point. What we've always talked about with able gamers and what we've always advocated for is we don't want you to change your game. Right. We want you to add options to your game. And interestingly enough, we actually go so far as to say if the option that we want fundamentally alters the game that you created, mm -hmm. we're not going to push for it because we believe it's an art form and we believe that you as a game developer should bake the game that you envisioned. That's a really important distinction. We're having some video issues here. So what, what is your sort of day-to-day -day now? as a, uh, you know, advocate in for gamers with disabilities? What are the big issues you deal with and, and sort of what does your job look like? So fortunately, Able Gamers is big enough that we actually have different people doing different jobs. So okay. my job now is really kind of talking with people, preparing for some talks that I'm doing. You know, I'm doing GDC next week, or maybe I don't actually remember. Um, I'm leaving for South by Southwest EDU on Saturday morning. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm prepping for that. You know, there's also a lot of internal stuff. You know, Able Gamers, you know, a couple of years ago, we were like a $22,000 charity. Mm -hmm. And uh, 2015, we broke half a million. Wow. And we're on track to beat that again this year. That's fabulous. So as we have these additional resources, we've been putting a lot more um, energy into doing stuff like grants and stuff like that. But grants are hard. Yes, they because, are. Well, not just hard. To, I mean, it's easy to give people money, but we're not just giving people money. We have to figure out exactly what they need. That's right. So if I'm working with a, a, with a person with muscular dystrophy or, or cerebral palsy or something like that, there's not like a a Band-Aid that says, oh, here you go. This is what you need. Mm -hmm. It's We have to kind of like, we handcraft solutions. So all of the, so, so, you know, when we make a decision, you know, when we make a decision to give someone a grant, that means we now have to get an accessibility specialist in, in right. there to figure out exactly what we're needing, what kind of switches do we need, what's the solution that's going to help that gamer get more into gaming. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, you would think it would be super easy to just give money away, but because there's all these steps and because we're trying to be good stewards with the money, I, would, I mean, the worst thing that could ever, like, my nightmare would be for me to give an accessible controller to somebody who doesn't use it. Right. Like, that would just be, like, terrible. And these controllers are not cheap. Mm -hmm. You know, they're 500 600 sometimes up to $1,200 a piece yeah. because they're handcrafted. These are very low volume things. I mean, I almost try to tell people like imagine whittling a controller. Right. That's what we're doing is yeah. we're having to pick, we're having to whittle a solution out for every individual person. Yeah. Um, we're also, we've made some pretty big changes where we've kind of actually pulled up one level and started doing these things called expansion packs. And what the expansion packs allow us to do is we're actually going into facilities where people with disabilities congregate. And we're putting game centers in those, ex those oh, facilities. Right. So instead of really helping one gamer at a time, we're helping 300 gamers at a time. See, I, um, I, don't, I don't know why rehab hospitals and things like that don't do that. My, uh, well, because there's a real good reason why. Okay. Because just a couple of years ago, gaming has reached this really interesting thing. When we started our mission mm -hmm. and we would go to somebody and we would say, well, hey, have you ever thought about how people with disabilities played games? Everyone would be like, who cares? Gaming is stupid. Why would I care about why would I care about people with disabilities doing something stupid? You know, I gotcha. actually remember having a parent tell me, "Well, I don't want my child playing video games. I'd rather them canoe and be out in the open." And I'm like, "Show me a kid that canoes. <laughs> like, show me one kid who's going, "No, I don't want to play Minecraft. I would rather canoe." <laughs> Said no <laughs> Screw child you. Yeah. ever. Screw you, Skylanders. I'm going right. canoeing. Now, if you could canoe in Skylanders. Skylanders? 
building a tent? Yeah. But so a kid I, will build a tent in Minecraft. No that's problem. fine. Yeah. But I just saw, so I actually literally said to that parent, why are you expecting your child to do something no other parent is expecting their child to do? And so that's, what I think, yeah. I think in the last five years, some studies and research has come out that's showing what gaming can do for isolated communities, what gaming can do for, you know, people with depression, with PTSD. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's all these studies that are showing that there is good in gaming. And I think really Able Gamers was ahead of its time. Because when we were talking about it 11 years ago, people were like, that's stupid. Hmm. I, you know, I want them to canoe. And now I think that the technology, the science has finally kind of at least started getting within the sight of the of the technology and there are people now who are doing studies i think you know it's just the arc of the arc of academia always runs slower than the pace of change so yeah. i think you're seeing academia finally starting to show that oh there's actually this really good world and people are actually choosing video games as not a waste of time like my mom always thought it was you know like crash on canoe yeah. um, <laughs> Which is funny because we didn't live near water, but I still wanted to be canoeing. Um, I think that p parents, because you and I are raising kids now, mm -hmm. I'm a you know I'm as a gamer since I had a Super Nintendo, and I had an Atari and yeah. I had a Commodore 64, so I'm aging myself. So I think now that gamers are raising gamers, yeah, I think gaming has become much more as an acceptable thing to do. And and this is a real problem in in my line of work because there's this schism with games for kids that the gaming sites don't cover. It's like, oh, our viewers, our, our, you know, users don't care about this stuff. And so this sort of coverage is left to the mainstream press. It does a lousy, lousy job. And so I always try to be really um, bullish on these, these new technologies, things like, you know, that portal power and things right. like that, that, that change the way people access games. I mean, VR is a, a huge paradigm shift in terms of, um, interface, you know, yeah. at least display interface. And, uh, I mean, these, these are important things and it's important for us to be able to explain to people why these things matter and, and why these things are, uh, useful. So I think there's a factor in there that you probably haven't connected yet and it belongs, and it's an American problem. Okay. One of the other reasons why I think kid children gaming is not covered as much as because in the U.S. we passed a law a couple years ago called COPA. Okay. Um, I can look it up real quick. It's C, COPA. Let me just look at, let me see. I think there's I'll a put stuff. a link up in the video. Yeah. So, but co what COPA does is it says that you as a site owner have to control access for children under 13. Yes. Um, and what a lot of sites did, so it's the Children's Online Privacy Protection Rule. Okay. And what that did was, especially for, for gaming sites, because Able Gamers actually started as a gaming site, we were actually affected by COPA, was it shifted responsibility of the site owner to make sure that perverts can't talk to kids. Okay. So that's why when you see in kid gaming, you see a lot of canned responses. So the kid's not able to freely chat, but they can be like, they can you know, select, hey, or oh yeah. Simlish, thumbs up, thumbs down, basic emotions. So that was actually something that's kind of come in because of COPA. Interesting. And the fact that game content creators were now being, being they had to accept responsibility for if a, if some really just kind of like, you know, nefarious person were to go into Minecraft or right. go into, you know, a game that was clearly Skylanders right. or something like that and tried to like pick up a kid, it was Skylanders' responsibility to try to make sure that that didn't happen. And I think a lot of, a lot of game sites yeah. kind of ran from that. So they stopped covering kids', kids games because they didn't want to attract children. Okay, that's very interesting. That's, that's very that's interesting. That's my theory. But I noticed that like we were covering games ranging, but like I don't think you can go find information on gaming that's rated like T you know young adult yeah. 
or not young adult, but like child games. I don't think you can find like I don't even think gaming sites will review those things because I don't think they want to draw an under thirteen crowd because they don't want to be responsible. And I mean, this Makes is one of those. Sense. I think this is one of those things where I think like our our laws meant well. Yeah. But there was this unintended consequence. Yeah, that's that makes a lot of sense because I could never figure that out because, I mean, I constantly get asked, what should I buy my kid? Are games bad for my kids? You know, right. and it's it's funny because people, a lot of moms expect me to be on teen mom instead of teen, ki- teen kid. And yeah, I'm really on teen kid and, it, and yeah, it, uh, I'm, it bothers a lot of moms. Well, I do these things. It's like, well, you know, Call of Duty actually teaches a lot about modern geopolitics. You don't know it's there, but, you know, teenagers are learning the correct names of countries and regions that are, are, are changing every few years and things like that. Uh, and they, they look at me like, you're not supposed to answer that way. Do you get that in, in your advocacy as well? A lot of people going, you're not supposed to answer that way? Yeah, I've had a lot of I've had a lot of conflict with parents, if that's what you're asking. Really? Um, yeah. Well, because they want their kids canoeing. Um, right. And well, but for children with disabilities, I think especially, I mean, I think parents are just really trying to protect their kids from failure as well. I've, so I've encountered this as well in the work I've done that they're afraid to let their kids try and fail. You know, meanwhile, I speak to adults with disabilities who've had disabilities since childhood is like, no, no, the best thing yeah. for me is fail I've got to fail quick, fail fast. Well, yeah, my, uh, uh, a dis, uh, you know, a friend of mine who's in a wheelchair, he's like, no, the best thing for me as a kid was they let me fall down, go boom, mm-hmm. because I determined my own limits mm-hmm. instead of, instead of somebody deciding for me what my limits were. So this, so think, this is still going on. So I think, yeah, and I think the other challenge is this. This is one of the challenges that I think is really important. For those of us, so I'm a gamer, and if I raised kids, I don't have any kids. My cats don't play games. If I had kids, my kids would be gamers. I know that the co-founder of Able Gamer, Stephanie Walker, has a 14-year-old daughter who's a gamer. She was a gamer. Her kid's a gamer. I think sometimes, though, when you try to introduce – so one of the challenges we have is when we're trying to introduce – gaming into a population of children with disabilities where the parent is not a gamer what you're really adding to them is just more stress because they're like i don't know how to turn on an xbox why are you asking me to do that i don't know like so you see like when you're when you're a caregiver to to a profoundly disabled um child like you like you're doing a lot of things that we all take for granted. Yeah. And if you just kind of, you're adding a level of complexity that they would rather not have. I'll tell you a heartbreaking story. So there was a there was a young man with um with Down syndrome in my own community who mm-hmm. was working to be an Eagle Scout, and he was in a um he was in a scout group that was um mostly youth with disabilities. So there was the, you know they they were you know a lot of people with Down syndrome and um developmental um, learning disabilities, things like that. But he did this, like, he wanted to do, like, a resource fair okay. for people with disabilities in our local community. And, and, he, and he approached he approached Able Gamers, and we said, absolutely, you would do this. You're in our community. Mm-hmm. And the whole time we were discussing what he wanted from us and everything like that, he yearned, yearned for a Nintendo DS like every question he would ask me, he'd be like, well, do you think a Nintendo DS would be something that would do really work for me? Mm-hmm. I heard about this game that you can play on the Nintendo DS. Nintendo DS. Like it was something that he clearly focused on. His mother was a helicopter mom right. who unfortunately wrapped this child in bubble wrap. Right. And he never fell. He's never ever. And I mean, I understand that. But at the same time, so I actually had an extra Nintendo DS laying around my house because I'm a gaming charity. Those things kind of have a tendency to accumulate. And so I went to the resource fair and I brought the Nintendo DS and his mom came over and said, hey, thanks for coming. And I said, I've got a gift for your son. And she looked me dead in the eyes and she said, if you brought him a Nintendo DS, so help me God, I will kill you. And we were in a church. (laughs) And but I video said, games cause violence. And I said, why? <laughs> and she goes, I don't have time to deal with that. And what ultimately, like, what, what we learned was parents are a governor for what someone in their charge can do. 
regardless of disabilities. I mean, we all parent children and mm-hmm. we have to set boundaries for them. But as these but as a, as this mother was doing is she was setting the boundaries so tight that this young man who was 22 years old yeah was actually not going to experience a lot of life right. because she wasn't going to allow it. Not that life was life was challenging, but it wasn't that he wasn't going to be able to cope with some of it. It's she didn't want to have to deal with it. Right. So it was out of bounds for him. And that was heartbreaking to me is why is she like, why is his quality of life have to go entirely through the filter of her quality of life? Yeah. I mean, this, this is getting into sort of dense independent living principles stuff, Yeah, you know, um, and this sort of segues into the whole mental health element because I think people tend to see sort of so-called physical disabilities and then and then mental health as as separate areas. But there's a lot of crossover, like a I, lot. There's, I think there's a lot of crossover. I think again, this is one of those things where it's different. Right. But some of the some of the outcomes or some of the manifestations are the same. Yeah. Yeah, that's well put. Now, for for people who don't know what this means, can you sort of unpack that? Um, no, I can't. No. <laughs> okay. Like, I mean, um, for me, like my big thing is is PTSD and things like that because you know, I, I that that's my personal story, and I really enjoy sort of these characters that people don't think of as as being sort of um, positive depictions of people with these these trauma conditions. Um, I like when I sort of, eh, eh, I see what you're doing. I see, I see what you did there. Yeah, yeah. I see what you did. Like God yeah. of War is, is one of my big things. Like uh, the, the Greeks wrote extensively on trauma without sort of realizing they were doing it. And, and it ended up in the game by accident. And that makes me sort of so happy because there's a classic example of an artist doing art and, and just sort of being true to the tradition and not, not realizing what they were putting in. But that that's why I'm so sort of big on... Um, characters as individuals with challenges as opposed to let's create a you know my, the one I come across is strong female character but then there's like strong character with disability or positive depictions of mental health I'm not sure what that even means anymore I, I don't either and I think that um, well I mean so it's 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 it's, it's, a, it's pretty dense and it's kind of hard it is hard to unpack but you know I think that the story the, the the characters that I enjoy the most the 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 fact that they're disabled or the fact that they're a strong woman is not the first bullet point in the description of that character i've always I'm always like really like offended when you when you when you kind of write straight to the point like yeah, it's hard to explain i'm I'm not well, really this sure. character is in the game. Because and I was ha- specifically yeah. trying to check this box. Exactly. Like, this character's in the game because they have a disability versus this character's in this game and they have a disability. Right. Like, yeah. it's, for instance, like, I didn't even, it didn't even dawn on me. I'll show you. I'm a disability advocate, and I run Able Gamers, and I was playing TF2, Team Fortress okay. 2. And I play a, um, I play the Gernady guy. I can't remember. I always pick him. But, yeah, I can see him. I, I, I don't, I, the class He's disabled. Yeah. Didn't dawn. It wasn't until someone said, "Oh, that's funny that you're playing the disabled character." I said, "Wait, what? Let me look at myself again." Oh, right, I have a peg leg. Yeah. And I'm missing an eye. Yeah. You know, I guess I am disabled. But I think the interesting thing was the way that character. If you, I don't think it was really a, d- a deep, deep written character, but it was. He's a really awesome character that happens to have a disability. Right. Not. It's a character with disabilities. That's right. You know, and so I respect. I have a much. I have much greater respect for people that kind of write in. They write in complexity into their character right. instead of trying to wrap a story into complexity. Yeah, like, I mean, representation doesn't have to be complex. You just have to get away from this idea of oh, default character in any narrative is a white dude. And any deviation from that able-bodied, you know, you, you do the checklist of, of, you know, normatives. If we get away from the idea that any deviation from that has to be explained, I think the problem sort of self-corrects. 
it, it, the fact that you have to explain it means you didn't do it right. I, I agree. So, I agree. like I said, I was a disability advocate, happened to play a character yeah. that was disabled, and it didn't even dawn on me because I was more... I was more taken aback by the way that character played and the right. funny things it said. And look, I got a parrot on my shoulder and I've got a funny hat that's on fire. And right. it never really dawned on me that I was missing an eye. Right. Yeah, I think a lot of people don't think of, you know, that sort of thing. I think people think if you have all your arms and legs. You're good. Yeah. Which or is you... the problem with mental health people. What? Arms, legs, ten fingers, ten toes? You're winning at life. Well, that's uh, a lot of invisible physical disabilities as well. Things like lupus, chronic fatigue, stuff like that. If somebody can't immediately see it, if a friend of mine put, put, said, if the problem can't be solved in a, with a wheelchair ramp, then they want to pretend it doesn't exist. Oh, yeah. You found that? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. I'm, a, I'm, I'm a person with disabilities and stuff. So I had a, 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 bad, a bad back injury when I was in the military, and I have very... Um, I lose a lot of feeling in my left leg. So there's a lot of nerve damage in my left leg. I can walk. Right. Um, but I've been told, like, well, why do you have a handicap sticker? You don't look handicapped. Huh. My, my exact response is you don't look like you're trained to make a medical diagnosis in a parking lot. <laughs> you don't look stupid either. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so I think that, yes, I th but I, I – but that's kind of how we look at things is, you know, you're fitting into what I consider normal. Therefore, you must be normal. And if right. you tell me anything that deviates from my definition of normal, right. then you're altering my existence. And, yeah. you know, and yeah. then sometimes they just get mad at you for being different. Like, why don't you fit into the stereotype that I put you in? Well, this, this also gets into the question of labeling. And this was sort of the last big thing I wanted to sort of talk about because identity is a big thing in gaming right now. And this idea of identifying as a person with a, a disability is a, a huge thing because to me, I find a lot of people that actually should be, you know, getting identified and getting services to make their lives um, more attuned to them don't do it out of pride. And, you know, they don't, they don't want to identify as disabled. And it's almost like there's a switch that flips in your brain, having gone through it myself, that, no... I, I can't just will my way through it. I can't just, you know, think happy thoughts and fly like Peter Pan. There is this limitation that I have to accept to address. Yeah, I I will say this is this is kind of one of those things where it's also very much to the individual. Mm -hmm. I I often will, you know, I play a lot of MMOs, and I will when I, you know, one of my favorite part of any MMO is building my character. Right. And I don't think. I ever build a character that represents me, like physically, mm -hmm. but then again, I personally look at video games as an escape yes. from my real life. Yeah. So it doesn't actually make sense for me to try to recreate. Like, I never understood Second Life. I was having a real struggle with First Life. <laughs> Putting another one in place just seemed to be adding to the complications. But we did a story about a place in Second Life that was dis that was a disability advocacy mm -hmm. group. And it kind of like, it dawned on me when I saw that they had actually put in the game a wheelchair. Yeah. I was like, wait, why would anyone want a wheelchair in Second Life? And they're like, because some people identify as part of them. And, and it was it was a learning experience even for me. You know, I, didn't, I wasn't raised a disability advocate. I was a, a clinic, I was a microbiologist in the Air Force. And, you know, this was, wasn't really on my, my plan to do. And mm -hmm. so I still learn and everything like that. But I guess this interesting is some people really strive to want to kind of like represent their true selves in games. And then I think some people really don't yeah. want to represent them true selves. And yeah. I think there's the, you should allow for both. Oh, I, you know, I agree. I, I found this with me with tabletop role playing. Everybody starts off making, you know, a Mary Sue character, a character that is essentially them. And it's that character that is going to be appreciated in ways you never were. And the longer you do it, the more experienced, the more comfortable you get into it. You roam further and further and further away. Well, because you're using it to explore. You're using it to explore something that's different than your real life. I mean, you're almost. You know, I think for the people that want to do that, they're adding. They're adding a rich. They're adding more experience into their life by playing something that doesn't represent them. Yeah. But at the same time, this is what I think is about great about video games because you can also play an ogre. Yep. 
And I have not actually met an ogre in real life. No, I mean, that was my big thing about World of Warcraft. Why would I pick an elf or a human when I could be a cow person? Right. And so, um, but I think that's what's great about video games is you can, you know, you can be anything you really want to be. And if that thing you want to be is a is a digital representation of you, awesome. Yeah. I, You know, um, I think it, I've learned that, like, you be you. Mm-hmm. Let me be me, yeah. however I want to be, and we'll be fine. Now, for someone to access Able Gamers, do they need a diagnosis? No. No, Able no. Gamers is there for everybody. So how does it work, you know, for things like a customized controller or things like, you know, on, on the... Clearly, mobile. you're going to need a custom... I'm going to tell anyone who's thinking about this. Like, right. if you don't need a customized controller, you don't want one. Okay. They're hard. They're okay. hard to play. They're different. This is an ergonomic... Well, I mean, there's thousands of hours that have gone into developing this thing. Which doesn't work worth a damn for me. If Xbox made a smaller controller, I would buy it in an instant. They make one. Do they? Yeah, it's called a Mini. Okay. You need to look on the internet more. I do. I've been looking for this. Mini. Okay. I have not seen, I've seen third party ones, but I've been warned they play like crap. No, we, okay. we we'll use talk off. all the time. Yeah, because yeah, that, um, that's the problem for me is, I mean, I'm I'm prepared to buy an Elite controller just for those uh, customization. They're pretty cool. Yeah, they, but again, you know, that I guess proves your theory that I wouldn't buy that just because it was cool. I'd buy it because I actually think it'll make gaming less painful on the Xbox. But if you buy it because it's cool, that's cool too. Exactly. But I think the thing is, I think if you if you need a custom controller, you're going to know you need it. And the, okay. thing, and the solutions that we're going to offer are probably going to be well beyond, like, I just, you know, I have some carpal tunnel. You know, we're, we're, we're really kind of working in, in disabilities that are much more limiting. People right. have much more limited range of motion. Um, you know, I tell a lot of people, like, you know, they sell arcade sticks on Amazon. And if you really don't like the controller, there's Xbox arcade sticks that are like you can have one in your house in two days. I don't know about mm-hmm. Canada, but we have, you know, Amazon Prime. Um, I think you guys have Amazon Prime well, Canada. We we have Amazon Prime, but it doesn't work as well as Amazon Prime US. It doesn't work as well here. Yeah. I tell you, in rural areas. Yeah. Amazon yeah. Prime gets a little little iffy here too. But my point being is, you know, Able Gamers is there for anyone. We don't. What we're really doing is we're advocating for people with disabilities. We're not. We're not, we're not segregating, saying, well, you don't qualify. I think I froze up again. There you, you don't go. Qualify. You're back, yeah. we, we're just saying, like, here we are. And the other interesting the thing that's really important is, is that we all have people with disabilities in our, in our lives. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, a lot of people we're connecting with, I mean, I, I hear so many times, you know, oh, you know, my cousin has this disability and I told him about you guys. I mean, we just had somebody in our, in our center just uh, last week who was a college kid that was with one of the, you know, was a student – was a was a was a classmate. That's the word I'm looking for. Mm-hmm. For uh, one of our volunteers, he was like, "Oh, you know, my, my classmate was in this accident, in a car accident. He doesn't play anymore. But now that I'm volunteering at Able Gamers, I actually think this controller right here would be perfect to him. Mm-hmm. Can he come over and and mess with? Like, yeah, that's what we're here for. So the gentleman came in and he tried like seven different controllers, and he's like, "Oh, that's the one that I think works for me." And I'm like, "Great. Well, what do you want to do?" And he goes, "Oh, I'll buy it. Mm-hmm. I just wanted to see if it worked before I bought it." And because like, you don't want uh, your house yeah. full of abandoned devices. Abandoned devices. Yeah. So he's and I'm like, well, great. Here's the phone number for the people you can order it from. And he's mm. like, okay, thanks. So it's just one of those things where you know, you know, there's nothing set. Able Gamers is here for everyone. Um, you might, you know, you, you might find some of the stuff that we're doing isn't right for you. Okay. But the interesting thing about Able Gamers is we'll try to find something right for you. No, that's um, awesome that you do that one-to-one support. That's as best we can. Now we're. We're, you know, we're a small group. We, we have a, we have a, a, a lab in, in Washington D.C. Mm-hmm. We have one in Toronto. Um, yeah, I was we, amazed to find that out. I'm excited to go check that out. We have. Um, Do they have stock- the mini controllers? <laughs> no, they got. They're, they're again. Yeah. Advanced. Of, I'll send you a link. Um, awesome. We just ordered one because we had a gentleman. Uh, Evil Controllers is going to re-drill and re-solder a controller for a young man that came in, and he. He has um, spastidization in his hands from muscular dystrophy, and he needs the little button somewhere else. So right. we ordered a mini controller. We sent it to Evil Controllers. They're going to go in and like put all these tiny little buttons everywhere for him. Um, so that's kind of the stuff we do. You know, we 3D print stuff, and we'll, you know. 
Do you do takes, custom keyboards at all? Because, I mean, I have a problem now that I can't do that stretch. Can't do it. Yeah, There's too many, can't. too many wires in it. So it's controller out. So this, this oh, we'll keyboard. Oh, we'll do keyboards. But there's, know, this, a lot of, there's a lot of really good keyboards if you look. But this keyboard and mouse primacy thing, that's a bit, you know, I guess that's something you guys aren't on board with because you can customize a controller in a way you can't with keyboards. Oh, no. I actually, I actually tell people, I actually think that most people with disabilities would be far better off in PC gaming than they would be. Interesting. In, well, because the because the the USB is an open it's an open source thing. There are so many things you can plug into a USB on the computer. Assuming the game is compatible with but, with that. But controller. even but even like there there are a thousand things that will look like a mouse to your computer that True. aren't mice. There's a thousand things that look like keyboards to your computer that aren't keyboards. Oh, like trackballs. And, trackballs and things like, like that. The ergo decks and little custom. There's so many options. That aren't that aren't there in consoles. Consoles that, that's be- true. They're closed consoles systems because of the way they're they're closed systems. Well, while a USB is literally open to the world, if you can build a HUD a HUD driver for it, you can build just about anything to talk to your PC. That's fascinating. The PC Master Race listeners are uh, viewers are going to be thrilled with you right now. They're going to be very very happy. I only game on PC. It's so funny. I have an Xbox. I have an Xbox and a 70 inch television in my living room, and my neighbor my neighbor CJ. Uh, he's nine, yeah. And he brought over uh, Garden Warf, uh, Plants vs. Zombie Zombies, Zombies yeah. Warfare. And he's like, "Let's play it, Mark." And I'm like, "Oh!" And I turned on my Xbox, and it's like, "Must update." Must and update. I think I, was, yeah. I think I was pulling an update that probably came out like four months ago because that's how often I turn the thing on. I'm like that with my Xbox too. It's it's just pretty much for exclusives. Yeah, it's and it's yeah, it's for exclusives, and it you know it looks real nice. Like people yeah. are like. Oh, that's pretty. And I'm like, yeah, it's an Xbox. But I would play my Xbox more were it not for those controller issues, the the, the left and right bumpers. When we talked over email, it was like, how do you get the left and right bumpers? And, and you told me that that's a common complaint. It is a common yeah, complaint. Yeah, on the Xbox controller. And this isn't, I don't like it. This is, it actually causes me pain. And right. I think that's something that people can't relate to. Um, final question Mark, just out of selfishness, because somebody asked me this the other day and I didn't have the answer. Mm -hmm. They are a disabled person with aspirations of writing about video games. Okay. And they don't know where the, you know, sort of places that are open to them are to apply because they have some communication challenges surrounding their disability. So I thought, well, I had you, I'd, I'd ask you sort of open because I'm sure if one person asked the question, there's 10 other people out there who are thinking the same thing they didn't think to ask. So I think that to that person, I would tell them that they need to go to the route of any other freelance journalist would. Okay. Write the, write the stories and then submit them to places that get published. There are plenty of Really great places that would love to have that content, mm-hmm. but you know this isn't a, this isn't even directed at people with disabilities. It's directed at everybody. Mm-hmm. Like, if this is what you want to do, do it, and then offer that product to the world. Don't come to somebody and say, "Hey, I have this product that I might produce. If you give me permission to produce it, it's the other, produce the content and take it to people, not the other way around." I think that. I, I would say that not just to a writer. I would say that to to anyone. If you if you if you have this desire, don't tell someone you have that desire. Do what you desire to do, and then find the person who's going to consume it. I don't I don't know a lot of artists who go, "Hey, I'm this really talented artist, but I'm not going to paint until someone asks me to paint a picture." I know, you know they paint, people like that, but, but yeah. they paint a picture yeah. and they offer it to. So right. the same with writing. I mean, Steve Steve Spawn, the COO of, of of Able Gamers, actually came to us as a writer. I wrote something on World of Warcraft, and I was apparently really wrong about it. And he was actually just a consumer of the content. And he wrote me this very terse email that said, "You're absolutely wrong about that." And I said, "Well, if you know so much about it, I expect your story in two days." Right. And he he said, "Okay." And here it was. And now you know, fast forward eight years and. You know, we're chugging along as able gamers, that's but fabulous. really that's how he was approached is he called out something that I did wrong and I challenged him to say, like, instead of just browbeating me for doing it wrong, if you have a, if you have the idea, I, yeah. I give you, I give you the access to post it. Go. I'm, I'm chuckling because I realize a lot of the opportunities that I've sort of taken because I, I've been responsive 
to certain things like, hey, you know, had you considered this or have you actually done this? And it, it was sort of that, um, you know, that, that what we call leaning in kind of, right. kind of attitude. Um, so I, I wonder how, what do you guys advocate in terms of disclosure for people with disabilities at the outset? We don't. We, Not, you know, no, no one way or the other? No one way or the other. I mean, people. some people want to disclose their disability. Some people don't. I wouldn't force that. If you write a really good story about, about dis- people with disabilities or gaming with disabilities or, or you know, we have, we have people that do reviews for our, our website who aren't disabled. Mm-hmm. They, learn, they learn what we're looking for as a, as a, as a, as a policy and they, and they, they execute, the, they execute the, the checklist. Right. Um, you don't. I tell everyone that you don't have to be disabled to be a disability advocate. You don't have to be female to be a female advocate. You don't have to be black to be an advocate for for you know equal. None of that. None of that. You if that's where you want to be and that's just something you strong feel, you just contribute to that cause. Mm-hmm. Like we're not. But it's it's I don't know. It's hard to explain. But it's just it just if that's where your passion lies, go with it. Well, it sounds like the general theme of what you guys do, your approach is personalization. You know, that's that's what it's all about. Yeah, that solutions for people, not necessarily solutions for a particular type of disability, just solutions for people. For people. Yeah. So if you could change to close, because we have to have something profound to close. If you could change one thing about the way games are created, sold, whatever, any aspect of the video game industry you'd like that you think would be most useful, most beneficial to gamers with disabilities, what would that be? Like if I were to advocate for one feature, like what one... one thing, whatever it is, no matter how big or small, just what's that thing you, you just wish a genie would pop out and you could get? I wish developers would pay more attention to how people are playing their games and offer help. Okay. One of the features that's most important to me because I'm trying to enjoy content and I'm not great with a controller is when there's a quick time event or there's something that I have to do in this particular order. Mm -hmm. And I am always fascinated when a game comes to me and says, hey, I noticed you've done this four times. Do you want to skip? Do you want to skip it? The answer is absolutely I do because I'm trying to enjoy your content. I'm not actually trying to, like, you know, I'm not trying to jump to the top of the cliff. Uh-huh. Like, you know, the jumping, just, and I think that, you know, that's, and I say that feature, and I know some people are going to watch this and go, Mark, that's a terrible feature, but one, it's my interview, so I can say what I want. Yeah. And number two, I think some of the more simple accessibility stuff is now becoming old hat. Yeah. You know, so I'm really kind of looking at that phase two stuff. And I think single-handedly why I've put any video game down is I've done it within the first three levels. And I've done it because whatever they've asked me to do is not fun. That, that's universal. This is what I hear. I talk to pros. I talk to just, you know, gamers. They all say, if it's not fun, I'm not going to play it. And it might have been fun up until that moment. Right. And it might be fun after it. Right. But I have put more video games down because of that moment of dissonance. Because of that one moment where the game is trying to get me to do something because they're looking for some trope or they're looking for some way to extend content. Right. They're putting a jumping puzzle in a game that's not supposed to be jumping puzzles. And I've just said, I'm done. You know what? This, was no, this is not fun. And if, and if this is what you're telling me I have to do now, I know you're going to tell me to do it again. In two more levels, mm-hmm. and I'm not going to have fun there either. So, hey, I'm glad you wrote 44 hours of content. I've only consumed 34 minutes of it, but I'm done. So making things skippable, because, I mean, I'm one of those people that's, no, I must do it the right way. Right. Because otherwise Say you, no but yeah. when they ask you if you want to skip. Exactly. See, I don't not offer that feature. Right. I, I wouldn't think to say, because it's not, no, I, I don't want to. Like, But I do. I am not harmed by that choice is the thing. So and and that, that's my one thing. Yeah. That's, that's really interesting. Well, I hope the developers that do watch that take that to heart. Cause that's, that's fascinating. We'll talk about it at GDC in a couple of weeks. Oh, there we go. Because, you know, I think of 
and I realize there are friends with disabilities who do not play games, and you're echoing what they're saying. They don't want their frustration threshold, because life is frustrating, they don't want it to go beyond a six. Why, why do I need a jumping puzzle in a shooter? Yeah. Well, what, why do I need shooting in, in, a, in a platformer? As right. well, it, it seems it's it's the 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 archetype I have for that is the sudden real time strategy level in uh, Brutal Legend, that okay. Jack Black uh, double fine game that was a really cute little adventure game, and then all of a sudden it became an RTS, and I was like, Wait, when did this happen? <laughs> and and it just felt like they were doing it to do it. It it felt like a lack of, and I almost put the game down if I hadn't been reviewing it. Um, I would have put the game down, and we even have something in reviews called Woolpaw's Law. When anything past a certain point will not improve your opinion of the game, you have the right to not complete the game, and I almost invoked it there. Because, yeah, you're, you're totally right. So that's, that's, my, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Fabulous. Mark Barley, founder and executive director of Able Gamers. Mark, thank you for your time, and I want that mini controller. I just looked it up. It's $39 at Toys R Us. Well, okay, but that's $39 American. Oh, so it's probably what, like nine hundred dollars Canadian? <laughs> it's like nine hundred. The Oculus, the Oculus is yeah. a thousand dollars up here. But that's not real. It's thousand Canadian yeah. money. Yeah. Well, it's you know. it's not just the exchange. It's our import taxes and our duties and all these extra surcharges. But your hundred dollar bills smell like maple syrup. And our twenty dollar bills have naked ladies on them. What? Oh yeah, there's naked women on our twenty dollar bill. It's I'm gonna go. I've got I've got twenty dollar bills at the headquarters now. Go look. It's the Vimy Ridge Memorial, but people don't care about that. It's there. There are naked women on our money. But your money has scratch and sniff one hundreds. That is the coolest thing ever. And well, we have we have uh, Peep Show money now too that you can. Oh, with the little windows in yeah, it. Yeah, we have those. Yeah, I just got back from London and they have the five dollar note or something like that has a window in it too, and I was. Typical American going, I was in a cab just going like, oh, check that out. Like, oh. Oh, we all do that when we're drunk too, Mark. It's not, oh, okay. You probably right. thought you were just a drunken local. Okay. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for having me.